Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Keeker, a principal user researcher at PlayStation Studios. So today I'm going to have to say Last of Us Part 2 an awful lot. So instead, I'm going to use the acronym TILU2. There are a lot of other online talks about TILU2's accessibility, but most of them are going to go into more depth about the features and options. This talk will focus on user research. User research was a fundamental part of the way that Naughty Dog developed games long before PlayStation Studios user researchers joined the mix. So let me do a little more acronym explaining before I list some of the roles that are important for your accessibility user research. ND equals Naughty Dog, PS equals PlayStation Studios, QA equals Quality Assurance Tester. Accessibility research started with the creative leadership at Naughty Dog. Liz Schmidlin, Lori Pham, and I led most of the testing, data collection, and analysis. Sam Thompson from PlayStation Studios was an unstoppable accessibility force. Producers from PlayStation Studios and Naughty Dog were crucial for advocating and resourcing accessibility efforts. Sam Schaffel performed and later coordinated accessibility QA efforts at Naughty Dog. This new role took on assistant producer elements in order to implement innovative accessibility features across functional groups. A dedicated playtest QA group moderated user research sessions, annotated player videos, and provided valuable assistance on analyses. A QA from Naughty Dog and PlayStation Studios ensured quality, including a small group at PlayStation Studios that were dedicated to accessibility QA. Accessibility feature creators detailed their needs for user researchers. In many cases, they participated directly in community outreach and in consultant ses testing sessions in order to gain empathy with their players. This is the introductory blurb on TLU2's accessibility page. Some of the things that they say hint at the work required to achieve this level of accessibility. First off, many of the features in TLU2 were born in Uncharted 4. Second, you need to start early and commit to planning and budgeting. Third, an inclusive design philosophy will help you make accessible features and fans. Fourth, customization is key to achieving broad accessibility. As implied earlier, preparation for accessibility and accessibility research helped Naughty Dog to achieve a more robust set of accessibility features than they had in the past. We'll start by talking about how community engagement helped us to set goals and metrics for success. Then we'll talk about how Uncharted 4 development and research on accessibility helped us to start TLU2 accessibility research from a position of strength. Then we'll talk about budgeting and resourcing. And we'll finish the first part of the talk by discussing pre-production and pre-testing work towards identifying player strategies. Community engagement was crucial to developing and executing user research. One example comes from the 2020 Game Accessibility Conference, where participants talked about what accessibility meant to them. We use many of these statements as goals and metrics for success. Accessibility is to be heard by developers. For devs to commit budget, time, resources. For platforms or developers to have reasonable, minimum, acceptable expectations for accessibility. For platforms and developers to hire accessibility community members. Accessibility is also enabling players to know if a game is accessible or inaccessible before they buy it. to be able to buy and launch the game, to be able to play, to be able to share game experiences with others, which means being able to be a valued teammate or a feared competitor, to have equitable, if not equal, gameplay experiences, to communicate with others 
in a way that doesn't tag you as different. Now, as we continue, I hope you'll feel that these needs have impacted our research. Alexandria Neonakis was the user interface designer on Uncharted 4. In one of her online talks, she notes that approaching accessibility on Uncharted was incredibly daunting. It can be hard knowing where to start. It can be difficult to get studio commitment to a long list of accessibility needs when needs, solutions, and costs are unclear. Alexandria, along with Amelia Schatz, felt that the best plan was to start small. Amelia started with camera management while climbing. She, along with a lead developer, were able to prototype some practical and plausible solutions. By sharing their prototype with the rest of Naughty Dog, they were able to shift perception of what was realistically possible to achieve. Reduced camera management for all players is just one example of numerous mechanics that were made more inclusive. In addition, Uncharted 4 shipped with 37 accessibility options. Nearly all of these options were carried forward for a head start on Tilu 2. At Naughty Dog, playtesting is a studio-wide event. The whole studio can view playtests in real time. Since playtesting is part of how the studio develops, testing had the impact of focusing the studio on accessibility for coordinated decision making. We knew that players have unique needs, so we set out to recruit 10 gamers with a broad array of motor disabilities. It turned out that a majority of our playtesters had their own successful strategies for dual stick play. They didn't actually use most of the options that have been created. Not surprisingly, those same participants were very competitive players. Both they and our consultants made it very clear that lowering difficulty was a necessary solution for some players, but it wasn't the best solution to enable equitable gameplay for them. For equity, it's important to give players as much control as possible. For example, some players may benefit from being able to toggle aim mode. This means tapping the trigger rather than needing to hold it throughout a fight. Our biggest lesson for user research from Uncharted 4 testing? Be wary of recruiting players by disability. Instead, recruit people who are known to face the accessibility barriers that you want to test. One outcome of Uncharted 4's accessibility effort was realizing that it requires budget, commitment, and PlayStation Studio support to meet your goals. Production and user research played a role advocating for accessibility with PlayStation Studios leadership. It was valuable to work with the legal team on community participation and legal guidance. Collaborating with Naughty Dog Communications and PlayStation Studios marketing and PR helped us to identify and plan for community needs and to host community outreach events. Some of the goals included connecting with accessibility consultants, and participants, uh, planning awareness projects for consumers, and planning awareness projects for our own PlayStation employee community. User research and production gathered both data and support to advocate for accessibility budget commitment. Production and user research played a strong role in community data gathering to prioritize needs. As shared publishing resources, we can help studios leverage shared knowledge across projects, including analytics insights from our game analytics team and best practices from other user researchers. Connecting Naughty Dog to tools, tech, and experts can also provide cost for quality savings. For example, production helped to investigate the potential use of platform solutions, such as text-to-speech tech. Of course, budgeting requires each development domain to estimate their resource and budget needs, including user research. Actually, as the game moves through production, a researcher's impact on budgeting may grow. Research has an important role in managing the budget. It can validate progress so the team can move on, and it can identify remaining or unexpected needs. Researchers should expect to revise their estimates and plans at regular milestones. 
The starting point for our user feedback activities was interviewing game accessibility consultants to understand their accessibility strategies. Why consultants? Because broad sampling to observe accessibility issues is impractically inefficient. They also tend to be connected to the game accessibility community, so they're often very empathetic. And unlike general gamers, we know that game accessibility consultants have spent time thinking about why they're blocked and strategies that they could use to try to get around those barriers. For example, Brandon Cole explained that opening the PDA in Resident Evil 6 would orient him in the proper direction for his target, which was a necessary strategy for him to navigate after he had listened to his target options. James Rath showed us how he uses his mobile phone to magnify indistinct text on a monitor. Though James and Steve Saylor could magnify imagery in order to read it, it was tedious to pause the action. So they also leveraged sightless play strategies, such as text-to-speech. Paul Lane and Josh Straub likewise shared some strategies, such as changing sprint from a hold to a toggle, so that they could reach the button needed to do a long-distance jump. Morgan Baker noted that she was missing out on audio cues, indicating the locations of off-screen enemies. Captioning for their dialogue wasn't positioned in the direction of their location. It was at the bottom of the screen. Ian Hamilton's work has noted that increasing subtitle readability isn't just a strategy for audio accessibility. It's also a primary strategy for reducing cognitive and vision accessibility blockers. These consultants helped us to understand the accessibility strategies that enable players. Execution is about achieving quality in the context of many priorities. The second half of this talk will focus on user testing activities. We'll talk about validating strategies with consultant usability testing. Then we'll talk about the need to bring consultants back for full playthrough testing in order to check that new content and mechanics haven't added new barriers, which they did, of course. We also identified unexpected accessibility barriers and gaps in our feature set by playtesting with a general audience. And we use general usability testing to understand accessibility issues at a deeper level in order to provide more inclusive design solutions. And finally, we'll talk about bringing in non-consultants that were known to experience accessibility barriers. Well, we brought them in so that we could make sure that accessibility strategies we were facilitating could be discovered and used by as many players as possible. Earlier, we spoke about identifying consultants' accessibility strategies. Next, Naughty Dog needed to try them out in the game. Roughly a year and a half before shipping, we were able to bring consultants back for usability testing. It was important to focus on specific parts of the game where accessibility strategies had been implemented. We made sure that consultants brought any assistive devices that they would typically use for example, cochlear implants or screen magnifiers. We coordinated heavily with the UI designer and scripters. Now, partly, uh, this is because Uncharted's UI designer had passed on such a solid foundation, uh, but it was also because Tilu 2's new designer, uh, Maria Capel, was a passionate advocate for user research and accessibility. Uh, we regularly synced on current design priorities, initiated broader design discussions about mechanics and systems, and jump-started testing with paper and QA prototypes. For example, usability testing with our audio accessibility consultant helped us understand how positioning the captions for enemy dialogue and sound effects near enemy subtitles would help players to get equitable location cues for those enemies. While validating sonar strategies, we discovered that some environments are just too dense with pings. Uh, in the release version, players were able to adjust the ping distance. We encouraged consultants to play at their own pace, pausing if desired, 
during long and intense encounters, saving progress frequently, and sometimes handing the gamepad over to a friend, a relative, or helper. We provided close-up access to the TV if needed. We accommodated wheelchairs, trays, and tables. We sometimes provided enclosed play spaces where players could minimize sound from other player sources and they could speak freely with guest observers. Uh, an omnidirectional mic was used to record questions and comments from consultants and people that accompanied uh, the playtesters, designers, and researchers. As new content and features were developed, the next step was to make sure that new accessibility barriers weren't being added. So we had the consultants come back when we could ask them to play through the natural game progression. Very little of the pathing had been marked up when consultants came in for usability testing. Consultant play testing identified places where audio pathing markers weren't working. Safe cracking was an optional but very valuable puzzle that relied on visual exploration. Significant design iteration was required to make it more accessible for sightless players. We know that the broad player base needs and uses accessibility features, even though they may not identify as having known accessibility blockers. And nevertheless, they will have accessibility barriers that are temporary, situational, or permanent. Accessibility strategies will be less often known, sought, or accepted by the general public. One method that we used to identify remaining or unexpected issues was our general playtesting. General playtesting participants weren't specifically recruited for accessibility issues. However, we did recruit for inclusivity. Uh, criteria included half TLU1 players and half survival horror slash action adventure players. We had gender balanced samples and sought to represent lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and queer perspectives. Recruiting from zip codes within two hours of Santa Monica helped us get feedback from players with a broad range of ethnic and cultural backgrounds. We used classic testing techniques to identify and analyze accessibility issues. And I'll go into a little bit more depth on these. Well, one thing that was very noticeable from real-time observation was players having trouble with combat. General playtesting helped us to identify a host of combat skills and threats that some players found to be inaccessible. For example, some players had trouble noticing when their allies were grabbed, which could lead to encounter failure if not acted upon. Now, this research helped determine the combat accessibility settings, which included allies don't get grabbed. Unfortunately, one big takeaway was that players are shy about using accessibility options. Our research suggested that this stemmed from many things, uh, including low awareness and understanding of options, an inertia to play on the designer defaults, and a desire to avoid the stigma of using the options. Now, this research informed a variety of design attempts to increase usage. Motion sickness is an example of something that's hard to recruit for and hard to see by direct observation. We were more likely to identify it by asking people to report discomfort in post-mission surveys. We also use surveys to check player understanding of the option labels and descriptions. For example, what's the dolly zoom effect? Now we have a few motion sickness related testing tips to share. For one, players may not want to admit that they feel sick for fear of being unable to continue with the playtest. Be ready to move playtesters to a separate room to provide comfort and to rule out screen closeness as a contributor. Often players uh, that experience motion sickness expect immediate relief after they quit playing, but they should be encouraged to rest before continuing to play or driving. Now I'll share an example that telemetry revealed. Um, we noticed that some players were rarely dodging outside of the dodge tutorial by looking at their uh, game telemetry. 
This is also an example of a case where we needed to dig deeper uh, in order to pinpoint the cause of that difficulty. Uh, it looked like low use of dodge was related to a host of subtle issues. Deep dives helped to iterate on the tutorial and on dodge timing reminders. Our experience with one-on-one -on -one usability testing solidified a few observations about accessibility usability testing. Focus on inputs and outputs rather than disabilities. To put this in more general terms, while it's popular to think that some people just don't like dodging or that some people just don't like aiming, it's really darn difficult to make sure that none of those people buy your game. Focus on specific accessibility issues, not player types. Break down the gameplay in a task analytic way from the perspective of the design. What approaches are available to the user? What skills and steps are needed? What rules need to be known? Observe players carefully. Let them struggle without assistance until they're no longer trying something new or they're backtracking. Then probe to understand their perception of the task and their problem solving strategies, including any accessibility options that they might or might not be using. Hypothesize about which mismatches between player understanding and design intent are the most fundamental contributors to the problem. After we'd validated our strategies with consultants, we needed to make sure that non-consultants could discover, learn, use, and combine those strategies effectively. These needs may be temporary or relatively new to the player, the accessibility needs. So needs may not be correctly recognized. Players may not be aware of the sophisticated coping strategies demonstrated by our consultants. To do this, we need to define gamers known to experience certain types of accessibility issues and add them somehow into our packed playtesting schedule. So what we did was we added uh, unguided playthroughs by up to two additional players in addition to our usual 10 that were known to experience accessibility issues. And we did this for probably about the last half dozen play tests that we did. Recruiting wasn't easy. Uh, production, PR and marketing from PlayStation Studios, uh, Naughty Dog Communications and uh, user research all combined uh, efforts to try numerous strategies to attract potential participants. This included reaching out to community organizations, participating in events such as the Los Angeles Abilities Expo and spreading the word via blogs and message boards. To give a few examples of some strategies that weren't that easy for our non-consultants to uh, discover, uh, one player uh, who had lost their sight as an adult uh, didn't have the same sort of skill at recognizing and distinguishing musical notes, pitches, and durations um, which was uh, very necessary in order to distinguish the different interactions and sound effects uh, that were in the game. Uh, so uh, this research encouraged the creation of an audio glossary. One player didn't select the preset uh, for vision or deeply explore the accessibility options on their own. Uh, they had a difficult time understanding how to combine options to their benefit. Uh, this research pointed out the need to make information easily accessible to the entire play ba player base about accessibility features, options, and strategies. To bookend this presentation, I started out by talking about how user research can help prepare for a robust accessibility effort and then describe many of the methods that we use to gather and analyze data, to identify accessibility barriers, and validate accessibility strategies, and to increase the inclusivity of TLU2's experience. To wrap it up abruptly, let me agree with Naughty Dog that games can always be more accessible. Thank you for joining me on this journey.